Today we're going to be making a cascade bowl, which is the very last thing that I was going to be making before the shop lost power. Two months later, here we are picking back up where we left off. Now, this entire process is going to be very simple and you can use this in a lot of different projects. And I figured the best way to show it off would be to use this huge honking piece of walnut that I have here. This is true eight quarter material and we are going to be showing off that we can stretch our downtown Ginny through two inches of material, even if it just barely can get there. So hopefully things will work out the way that I think that it should, but who knows, anything could happen. Now right here we have eight quarter material and what eight quarter material is, is referencing the fact that four quarters makes an inch, therefore eight quarters would make two inch. So we're almost at two inches tall, actually it was 1.95 inches. Doesn't matter to y'all, but for me when I'm toolpathing all of this, all that's really important so that I'm not messing anything up. We're going to be drawing a 12 inch circle on our material and then subsequently we're drawing smaller circles and we're assigning a toolpath for every single one of these smaller circles as we go in. In each one of these circles, we are going to be clearing out material. Every single one of those, as we clear things out, we're going to be stepping down and that's what's going to, if we're looking at this as a cross section, that is what is going to establish our bowl with all of these little steps. Now, the way that this is going to look very nice is using our bowl cut bit. Our bowl cut bit right here is only one of the three bits that you need to see and see with me. And this in particular is what gives a ton of our projects a really, really nice look because of its 3 16 inch radius on this bit. Now this radius is going to be at the very bottom of our project for every single one of these toolpaths. And it's gonna leave us with a very, very nice looking bowl. Now this bit does have a flat bottom on it right here and that is only an eighth of an inch. And what that means is we have to keep our step over very tight. For a final pass, it's going to look great. You're not gonna to have to do a ton of sanding, but for an area like this where you're trying to hog out as much material as possible, what we're gonna be doing is creating a roughing pass specifically for this tool. And what we're doing is instead of just stepping over the amount that's going to affect the flat space, we're gonna be stepping over the full amount of the bit, which is half of an inch. This is going to create a lot of noise, and if you've got a machine that can handle it, it's all gonna work out perfectly fine, but it's not going to create a very flat bottom. So for every one of these outside toolpaths that we're creating, we're going to be doing the roughing toolpath, and then this very last one, as we're doing this clearance for the final pass or the final depth that we're looking to achieve, we're going to run it as if it were being run normally so that we get a very nice flat and smooth bottom, whereas we're just trying to save time for the rest of these when we're clearing out this material. And last but not least, we're gonna be using our downtown Jenny to come and profile everything at the very end. And like I said a second ago, this bit is not meant to profile two inch thick material. Normally you would want a quote unquote long reach bit. And the longer the bit, the more opportunity there is for breakage, which is why this bit is set up this way. Even though the flutes are not two inches thick, we still can get down to depth because we're only taking off passes as we're going down instead of going to the full depth. If we went to the full depth the very first time, it wouldn't have the cutting edges to actually intercept all of this material on the side, which is why we step down in our material to get to that finished depth. I don't think we're gonna have any type of an issue, but we'll see. Without further ado, let's go ahead and go into the wood shop. We're gonna be putting double-sided tape on the very bottom of this, and that is how we're gonna be securing this piece. I probably am gonna sneak in a few brad nails on the corners just to make sure it's not moving around because this bowl cut bit, the way we're doing the roughing pass is going to push on the material a whole lot. So hopefully things stay in one piece and we'll see. Let's head out to the workshop. Some of y'all might have noticed that I got a new dust boot on here, and this is Rowdy Roman's uh, Swinger dust boot, and I'll have that link down in the description below. I'm currently testing out a few different dust boots because there is a ton of really cool stuff on the market, and I honestly have no idea which one I'm gonna be using uh, for the foreseeable future, so doing a few tests here. As you can see, I put in the bowl cut bit, and then I put the bowl cut bit like way beyond the bristles of the dust collection boot and yeah chips went everywhere it was collecting probably i would say about half of the chips but as you can clearly see this is how we're clearing things out just a step at a time we're doing our full step down and then going in a vector full step down going in a vector and like i mentioned earlier this is the roughing pass the very last final pass it's actually two final passes but uh, those are going to be our cleanup paths and it's going to leave a very nice area that's going to be really easy for us to sand just get nice and smooth later. After that, I put in the downtown Jenny, and this is what I was talking about earlier, where we're stretching this bit as far as we can, and things did not work out 
exactly as I had hoped. I got a little bit of chattering in there and that definitely showed up on the final piece, uh, which we'll see in a second. Now, after that, I rounded things over a little bit with a 3 16 inch round over bit. I feel like it matches up really well with the bowl cut bit and then did a little bit of sanding and we are left right here. So we're gonna finish this in a second, but I wanted to go ahead and touch on uh, what we currently have and a few of the areas that might not look great. As you can see right here, this is the very edge of the bowl. And I sanded a good portion of it, but you can see areas that ripped out. A little bit of that is the fault of the bit itself. And then some of the grain direction where it's cutting and everything. But you can see that it's not exactly perfect. Of course, all of that can be sanded out, but yeah, not super great. Now, of course, your material does not actually have to be this big. We're just going off of the fact that our radius is 3 sixteenths of an inch. So every single one of these vectors that are going inside, we're bumping that in 3 sixteenths of an inch to fully utilize the radius of that bowl cut bit. Obviously, this is two inch thick material, so it has an amount that it can do that before it bottoms out. So if we're using one inch thick material, we might be able to get away with half of those, but we can still have a good final product. Now, if you're doing something big like this, this is 12 inches. I really wouldn't go that wide with a much thinner material because we've got these big thick walls. It's gonna have a little bit more resistance to warping. If you're using a single piece of wood like this, there is a very good chance that something that is dimensionally stable as you know a solid piece of wood the second that you carve out areas of it, it's going to try and bow. So it's going to end up with something like this or twisted or something like that. So normally when people make a bowl this big, they're going to be laminating different types of material together so that you end up with a very dimensionally stable blank that you're working with. If you're unfamiliar with what lamination is, it's when you take different strips and then you glue all those strips up together to be able to make the piece of material that you're carving out of. This can all be the exact same material. It can be different types of material. This is where you get people who have uh, bright stripes of wood going through their main piece, but they're doing this to be able to create stability in their material. Like I said earlier, if you're not doing something that's two inches and you're doing something that's one inch, definitely using less of these step downs is going to look great, but maybe swapping down towards like an eight inch bowl uh, with a single piece of wood that might work a little bit better. I probably wouldn't go all the way out to 12 inches. I'm liking the way this is looking. Let's go ahead and throw some finish on this. And while it's drying, we'll do our mystery file. Well, it is time for this week's mystery file where Mitz sends me over some mystery G-code and I put it in the controller and we press go. First and foremost, we're running a 60 degree and it's going to do something. No clue what. And then our downtown Ginny, which is going to finish up doing something. Let's see what Mitz has in store for us today. Oh, well, looky there. A little sunflower napkin holder thing. This would have been really great out of like some walnut plywood. And since it's made out of MDF, it just doesn't look as great as it could, but Sheesh, this is an awesome project. Thank you very much, Mitz. I think I set my Z depth a little bit too low on where the seeds of the sunflower seed thing is. And therefore, it's like kind of like a little bit messed up. But other than that, this is awesome. Thanks, Mitz. First off, this is an expensive way to do this. Now, using eight quarter material and then spending the pure amount of time on this, this is not something that I specifically would go out and sell, especially for not like a market, because I probably have around an hour of machining in this, and that was even with the roughing passes. And if you don't have a nice beefy machine, that's gonna be pretty difficult, specifically with these bits and what we're trying to accomplish right here. Obviously, if this is smaller, your time is gonna be considerably less involved in it, and there's certainly ways that you can speed things up. But all in all, the wood is expensive, the time is expensive, and somebody's probably not willing to pay $100 for this, where you might think that it's worth $100, Somebody else probably won't. Number two, tedious tool pathing. Now I go over everything in the toolpath tutorial with a ton of different tips and how to be able to know the difference between a roughing pass and a finish pass. And there's some really great information in there, but it's really tedious. When you're doing a 2D toolpath like this, you're selecting every single vector and you're assigning a toolpath to it. And that runs into a lot of time. When I first started CNC machining, this is exactly what I would do. I had no idea how to do anything with 3D and I would do everything that I could with 2D and start stepping projects down and then running into something that I loved as a final product, but I was spending a ton of time on it. And then number three, hobby machines are not built for eight quarter lumber. 
I come from the world of table building, so I have a ton of eight-quarter materials still left around from those days, and that's what we would make tabletops out of, really big, beefy, heavy stuff. These hobbyist machines are not really made for eight-quarter materials. They're made for plywood and having thicknesses up to an inch, and they really excel at that. But when you throw eight-quarter material at it, you start having to think about how you're clamping things and how your dust boot is going to clear stuff and especially how your bits are going to be able to get down into the depths of the material that you're asking it to do. It creates an entire different set of challenges that you might not have thought about before, but if you're looking to create an end result like this, especially a ton of them, looking outside of the hobbyist CNC machine area might be the right thing to do. Now, there's certainly some stuff you can do to get ahead of that, long reach bits, but the longer that you're reaching your bit out, the more attention you're gonna to have to pay to your feeds and speeds, because that is a very easy way to break a bit. Your machine can be as rigid as possible, but the second that you have a huge bit sticking out there and then running it the same way that you might run it as if it was an inch and a half out of the collet, it's just a different way to cut things. So I really wanted to show this off in particular because A, I think the piece of wood is really beautiful and I obviously need to put a few more coats on this. You can see where I've got some finished puddling up and I've got to do a little bit more sanding. But I really wanted this piece of wood to show off this project. You can do this exact same thing and create ring dishes. I have a ton of videos where I go over catch-all trays using bowl cut bits and then showing how they're able to swoop down and create a nice little 3D effect while still just maintaining 2D tool paths. And the nice part is you're not taking out this material. You're showing that it has a nice slant to it. You're giving the buyer something to look at a little bit extra, but you're also not taking that material out. All that to say, if I were to do all of this over again, I would probably shave this down to like an inch and a half as far as the material is concerned because these bits are really great for up to an inch and a half and not have to worry about all the different considerations that you would have to do to be able to achieve this end result. Next, there definitely is some more sanding to do because I know that this can look considerably better than it currently does. But for all intents and purposes for this video, this is a really great finished product. This is not something that you're going to be able to beat Target or Walmart or Hobby Lobby on because at the end of the day, the customer really doesn't care about all of these considerations that we're talking about to get to this final product. They see this and think, oh, that's probably 15 to $35. They don't see this and think of, that doesn't even cover the amount of time that it takes to machine the project, not to mention the fact that it's walnut, an eight quarter walnut can get absurdly high. This file itself is available now on cncwithme.com. Like I said, I've got the toolpath tutorial so that I can teach you how to be able to translate this project into any size material that you personally have. But you, if you wanna make this exact one, we definitely have that available in Carveco, Vectric, SVG, and DXF files, ready for you to be able to use with your own machine at home. I'm sure people have already written it down in the comments, but I'm obviously not very good at drawing S's. Um, that's something that I think I'm gonna to have to get better at. See, that's considerably better than that. <laughs> Oh man, I just don't even know how to draw anymore. Yep, I don't know why this is so difficult for me. Like, I can do, obviously not now because I'm thinking about it. Okay, let's let's start again. Boom, boom, boom. Nope. Tiny top, big bottom, over. Yeah. Okay, that's a pretty great S. We'll keep that one. We're not going any farther than that S. <laughs> so it should have, imagine that this is right there. Yeah. <laughs> Thanks everybody. See you next Friday. Bye.